views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hola everyone, welcome to Open VFRX Remote, brought to you from my living workspace, Chari Executive Suite. I'm Rina Valentin, your host of Café Con Leche every Friday. Here's what's coming up in today's show. Lady Bizarre will speak to fashion designer Ellie Ballet to discuss advocating for better customer service systems and security education on social media platforms. Then we speak to Evelina's 100 Centennial Celebration co-chairs, Alba Cabrera and Dr. Nidia Edgecombe to discuss the Evelina 100 Centennial Art Auction celebrating the life and work of Dr. Evelina Lopez Antonetti. After that, we'll be joined by Dance Parade NYC's Executive Director, Greg Miller, to discuss being back on the street celebrating 16 years of dance and diversity. Later on in the show, Bobby C brings us an up to date with the latest headlines in the world of sports. And lastly, this week's Open Artist Spotlight shines on playwright, performer, acoustic punk rock, rock and tour, and educator Alvin Ang with a performance at the end of the show. So sit back y prepárate. All this and more is headed your way because now we are officially open. Welcome to Open. I'm Rina Valentin, your host of Café Con Leche for the next hour, inviting you to get social with us online. That is, tweet us and follow us on Instagram at BronxNet TV and like us on Facebook at Open BronxNet Television. And of course, while you're there, don't forget, follow more on Twitter, FB, Instagram, Insta Stories, and LinkedIn at Rina Valentin. So our first guest is a Lebanon Syrian fashion designer. He, who since uh, childhood has been sewing and just loving the fashion world. His brand is recognized as a household name for its quality and definitive design currently selling in over 30 countries. In February, he debuted his Feather, Diamond, and Pearls Couture collection at New York's Fall Winter Fashion Week, showcasing handmade outfits embroidered with Swarovski crystals, pearls, mink furs, and feathers. And today, though, today, he joins us to discuss his recent cyber hack on his fashion Instagram account that had over 200,000 followers and is now affecting his brand. He's here to voice his opinions to advocate for better customer service systems and security education on social media platforms. Here now to share more is fashion designer, Ellie Bale. Uh, thank you for being here with us um, under these unfortunate circumstances. However, this is certainly a topic that we do need to discuss in detail. Um, it's happening too, way too frequently, way too frequently. I'm sorry about your mishap, and I'm sorry that you're still dealing with that. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm so happy to be on the show. Uh, it's been happening for quite some time for the past month or so. There's a huge spike with hacked account on Instagram. I many of my models were hacked, um, and they shared their experience, and it was absolutely horrific. The company uh, mostly works on robot and automation and and uh, and, uh, and smart intelligent, and there is no customer service. Um, Overnight, as a matter of fact, on the 15th, on uh, Friday the 15th, we I was preparing for the holiday. Me and my wife and my daughter, we were jumping from place to place to try to prepare food for the holiday. And one of my uh, model from Switzerland sent me a message. He does have a broken English. He's like, I was, I was actually nominated to, to to be a brand ambassador for a big design a brand and would you vote for me I said okay no problem you know he's my model he always 
is a very, very uh, um, top paid model. And I said, yes, I will do so. And then a few seconds later, I'm like, you know, busy, not paying attention to what's happening. He says, please check your text and you're gonna get a message. Screenshot it and send it to me. Do not click it. I, I first thing first, I'm always aware. I'm very into high tech and IT and I'm pretty comfortable with computers and everything in between. I know that when I click, that could be um, a virus or something with hacking. When he says a screenshot, I did not pay attention to that he is able to, from the screenshot, mimic that URL and get me hacked. So what happened is after I sent that message, after I sent the screenshot, I knew I was hacked. I don't know how, but I just got locked out and, and the world has shut down on me, literally. Um, and so we were I, talking about the holiday of Easter, right? I just want to be clear. Right. Yes, uh, yes, our yes. Tours, right? So we're talking about the holiday of Easter. You had just recently finished a fashion week, right? Um, I agree, and, yes. um, in February, right? Yes, we had February fashion show in New York fashion week. And then we had Milan fashion week. And then we had LA fashion week. And right after that, we also had, um, we were, um, we were supporting Ukraine. We did a fashion show in Times Square. It was covered by Inside Edition and a few other outlets. As a matter of fact, you covered that story. And um, also we were invited the, the, the day after to the um, to a visual for Ukraine where um, I was, um, um, I had a, a little combo and uh, the councilman of Ukraine um, sh shook my hand and says, thank you. And he was so happy that we were supporting Ukraine and, uh, and you know. But, and it's beautiful. It's lovely. It's lovely. It's lovely that, that we're all in this together in some form or other. Right. And, and, and thank you for sharing all those details. But I do, I want to share with our viewers, you know, I wanted to give them a little insight as to who you are. I mean, your, your, your fashion is uh, available in Nordstrom and, and, and Saks and Bloomingdale's and Lord and Taylor. Uh, and, and I just want them to know that we're talking big time here, right? Uh, for lack of a better word. I, well, um, my brand um, is, I was very known for the boys. Um, we were the leading brand in boys. Uh, uh, as of a few years ago, we became very big in men's as well. And we, uh, we, we supply all the majors from Macy's, uh, Bloomingdale's, Saks, um, Nordstrom, um, 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 Lord and Taylor, I can't even stop counting. So uh, I am not absolutely the, the designer that would do custom. I do, do, I do have my couture collection, but I'm not the designer that wait for one customer to make a, a party outfit and then hope for the best. I mass produce. You can find all our design on many websites and in stores as well. And, um, and, and I guarantee you're going to love the way you look. Oh my gosh, I love that. <laughs> I love that. And and so I'm going back and forth about your, your fashion wear and also what you've been enduring for the past uh, 20 days or so. Um, and I want our, our viewers to understand that uh, the, the caliber of individual that you are and what's been done to you and how um, in some aspect you feel, or I mean, I went through it myself. I was hacked. So I understand what you're feeling. I, I'm sorry that you haven't been able to recover it but to lose 200,000 plus followers and to lose all of your history that has been on record over the years and not have someone or a live person, I should say, to uh, address your, your needs to, it, it's an issue. It, it definitely is an issue and it was an issue for me as well. I 100% agree. Uh, Zuckerberg needs to step to the plate, even though he is in the news now, his wealth gotten smaller. And I would like to give him this message. You need to be on top of your game. And if you're not, you will be the next falling building. What I'm trying to say that 
that is we the consumer that made you rich they are struggling with the new um new trend that's happening where a lot of people are getting hacked and i, I can tell you this much yes i got hacked i my life achievement my life success my life fame is washed away by someone that did not uh, how to say uh, someone that was not on top of his game meaning i was tricked and i got hacked but this is a privacy issue i mean there was they there was 15 of my follower that got hacked and they keep on calling me and telling me I got hacked because of you. How do I feel? Let's not talk about how do I feel and how how much money I'm losing, how much business I'm losing because all my fame got washed away. The hacker literally deleted every post that we have from fashion shows to magazine coverage to to anything, you name it, it was all deleted. 3,500 posts was deleted. Not even, he didn't even stop there. The, the hacker actually went ahead and, and tagged all my, like when, when, when a model walked for our show, she posts it uh, on Instagram, for example, and she tags you. The guy removed that. I mean, for example, a lot of the consumer, they, they wear our product and as much as they love it, they actually tag us there. And all that was gone. It was washed away overnight. Mr. Zuckerberg, wake up. I'm hoping that maybe um, Elon Musk will take over. Maybe we get someone to actually do the right thing for the consumer that made you rich. Right. I get it. I get it. And, you know, you guys, we're, we're having this conversation because it's important that we all come together and file a complaint. And um, I think the more of us that do so, the, the, the better chances we have of getting a response from a live person. That's the true conversation. All right. Once again, thank you, Ellie Ballet. And um, you guys, if you're interested in more information on Ellie, you can go visit his website at Ellie Ballet. Com. We do have to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll hear about a special art auction dedicated to civil rights activists, Dr. Evelina Lopez Antonetti. Don't go anywhere. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. Our next segment is on Dr. Evelina Lopez Antonetti, known as the mother of the Bronx, a community organizer and education leader who advocated for better education systems for Puerto Rican and other minority children in the Bronx. The legendary Dr. Antonetti founded United Bronx Parents in 1965 in the midst of the civil rights and students' movements to foster quality education and community control of schools while expanding to include a bilingual bicultural day care center, an adult education program, and a youth leadership center. Currently, United Bronx Parents maintains three sites in the South Bronx and has evolved in different directions throughout the years. This year, the Evelina 100 Centennial Committee is celebrating the life, work, and leadership of Dr. Evelina Antonetti and what would have been Evelina's 100th birthday this upcoming September 12th through the 19th of 2022 beginning with an upcoming special art auction selling unique art, limited edition prints, and commemorative posters created by world-renowned artists. And here to share more is Evelina's sister and honorary chair of the Evelina 100 Centennial Celebration, La Madrina de los Artes, El Dr. Era, <laughs> along with chairwoman of Evelina's 100 Centennial Celebration, Dr. Nidia Edgecombe. Hello and welcome, ladies. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Oh, it's thank you. Such a pleasure. Oh, it's always a pleasure to have you, our madrina. Oh, and and you know, to be able to have conversations uh, with the living source, it, it, it's even more magical and special. So, thank you for being here with us, and, and oh. for sure that you're here, make, advocating for us in the Bronx. Um, so, let, let's talk about the art auction that um, you, I think, are uh, in charge of. 
well, you know, you know how I am with the arts. And I said, why don't we have an art auction, you know, and we could raise some funds to defray costs. And everybody said, well, that's a great idea. So from that, that moment on, we started collecting. I, I have a quite a collection. So I started to look. I could tell you it was very hard picking out the ones I was going to donate it because I felt so close to them. But I said, well, it's for my sister. <laughs> and that's what we did. And other people like Nidia and others have donated. And uh, one of the wonderful things that happened is that I have some posts, we have some posters, we have some originals, and we have some photographs from very important photo, uh, photographers, including Joseph Conzo Jr. Yes, and <laughs> Dave Gonzalez, uh -huh. and uh, Francisco Reyes, uh, R Ricky Flores. So you know where I'm going, it's the seis. It's the group. That's the, the seis del sur. And it's just been wonderful because some of the, you know, the photographs are unbelievable and they're iconic. People will recognize it. So that's going to be one of our star uh, shows. Right. <laughs> well, it's, what, it's going to be, that's going to be on display for auction. So people can actually purchase it is what you're saying. Exactly, exactly. Ooh. Oh, that's yeah. delicious. That's delicious. Yeah. And, and if you, you, I know you're familiar with their work, but you're familiar with David's dances, right? The dances? Yes, yes. the yeah, one that that that's one. on the street, that's like iconic. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And, then, yes. and, then, and then Joey has one also, different time, a different couple dancing in the street. So it's, it's we're excited. We're excited. I know, it sounds exciting. It sounds like a nice yeah. little trip into a time capsule. I'm looking yes. forward to that. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. so I want to talk to Nini a little bit because, yes. well, first yes. of all, I want to congratulate her on her PhD, <laughs> Doctora. Welcome. <laughs> so Thank you. I'm very honored to be here with you, Nina. You're such an icon in our community as well, just like Evelina Antonetti. Aww was during the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. She was the woman who led the Puerto Rican community, a community that le faltaba todo, that you know, was out of the mainstream of society in terms of what they needed and what they uh, wanted. And she was the voice of a, of a Puerto Rican community, over 150,000 Puerto Ricans residing in the community of the oh, South Bronx, no. the Bronx was actually yeah. decimated by fires, you know, that, that area of the Bronx. So I believe the purpose of the Evelina 100 centennial celebration with Elva as being the uh, honorary chair is the purpose, the whole purpose is to sort of reintroduce one of our women, a woman from the diaspora, nobody talks about us, you know, sort of to introduce her to a new generations of Puerto Rican and young people in, in New York City who are active now doing their own community activism, but many of them, they don't know about her. In the, in the process of celebrating the Evelina in September 2022, September 12th to the 19th, her birthday, September 19th, we're gonna create poetry about Evelina. We're gonna create art about Evelina, you know, the president of Bostos Community College, Dr. Coco de Filippi, Daisy Coco de Filippi, is reciting poetry at our celebration about Evelina. Antonio Martorell is painting Evelina Antonetti. Manny Vega is painting Evelina Antonetti. Marcos Dimas from El Taller Boricua is painting Evelina. Neil Satufino, um, Lynn Samuel, Samuel. Samuel. Um, so we have a group of people just painting Evelina. Sara Morales also, who just did the poster for Comité Noviembre also. And there are scholars presenting their work. A lot of people has written about, but there are a couple of women who has written their PhD, their dissertation on Evelina, including me, but there's also uh, Dr. Laura Kaplan, who wrote about the bilingual programs that Evelina created for the Puerto Ricans then and now for the Latino communities, we still have 
the food program that Evelina was the this was the first one to have a summer um uh public Free summer lunch program program yeah. and mm -hmm. she ended up serving that for the entire city of new york city a puerto rican woman then had that power to convince the government that she was going to handle that you know she used to distribute okay. over 150 a thousand um breakfasts and lunches a day throughout mm -hmm. the city of new york so there's a lot to be said. There's also an embrace between Puerto Rico and New York as part of the celebration. Digna Sanchez, the great, another diasporican woman now residing in Puerto Rico, she's preparing an embrace of community activism between La Gente del Caño de Martin Peña, which is an organization in Puerto Rico of community activism, and La Casita de Chema. So we have a lot in the words. El Centro de Estudios Puerto Ricanos is also do, doing a document exhibition on the Thursday, okay. September 15, exhibiting how Evelina, there were no computers, and Evelina used to write the proposals from the government by hand. This handwritten documents exist at the Centro de Estudios Puerto Ricano and Angel under the leadership of Jarimar and Angel Ruiz, uh, Jarimal Bonilla, the director, and Angel Ruiz, the director of um, culture and art at the Centro. They're putting together an exhibition so people can see how difficult it was to do what Evelina did. Evelina well, was, was gonna... tentacles all over the place, all over the city. Yeah, like an octopus. And and I want to say that we're probably going to invite you back on as we get closer to September. But I'm happy that we're able to at least share um, the the gist of the, the generalized uh, itinerary of what September 12th through the 19th looks like. Um, originally, we were here to discuss the art auction. Um, but I think it's important that we kind of uh, start introducing people to this big celebration that also includes Pregones PRTT, which we did mention, yes. right? Yes, yes. Is there anybody else that we forgot to mention? Yes, it's also Elena, yes, Martinez, Center, the Elena Martinez Center, the uh, Bronze Art Heritage Center, which are opening their new, new venue now this summer. Elena has been instrumental. Elena has two events, a suffragist, uh, you know, the suffragistas, the voting registration campaign with the, with the group of women play music about voting and women's rights. And then she had the four Apache panel, a panel presentation with the four Apache concert at night. And that was, that's from September 17th. So we'll come back for that, but there's so much and people are so eager to participate and to be part. And Elena is chairing with Wally Edgecombe. They're chairing the cultural committee for the Evelina Centennial as well. Could I, could I interject? Um, yeah, I knew you were coming in. <laughs> yeah, no, because I, I, no, I wanted to, to be sure to mention uh, uh, Maestro um, este, este Ponce, right? Yeah. And he's part of it also and uh, we're having a reading of of the play Evelina's Heart by uh, Sandra. Sandra Rodriguez which is wonderful uh, it, the play she wrote originally was 20 years ago but she's updating it and it'll be a reading probably at Ostos Nidia Yes, it's going to be at Ostos at the grand opening of our celebration with the we're hoping to have the chancellor of the university as well. Um, and it's gonna be at Ostos on Wednesday, September 14, and all that is coming. And with Maestro, Maestros is closing the week uh, on, on a, a Sunday, the 18th, with a Bente Tu. Oh my gosh. And that, that's what we have time for today. But I promise you, we're gonna have you back on. Because this is okay. a, this was like a jump start of, of what we're going to be sharing with our viewers because we have so much time from here until September. And it, I'm so excited just to hear everything that you shared. And because there are so many organizations and institutions involved and so many different aspects and different components and different um, aspects of, of like uh, the, the community activism, the arts, the um, even the parks. So um, I'm looking forward to learning more, but we are out of time and I'm sorry about yeah. that. That's okay.
And, oh, uh, we love yeah, you I, too. Oh, oh, I can't wait you're to see you. You're very important. Okay. You're, you're one of our women in our community. We love you. Okay. And, and I love you both. Thank you. Okay. We'll see you soon. All Take right. care. Bye-bye. Right. Madrina de las Actas, don't go nowhere just yet. And of course, Dr. Emilia Edgecombe, and they are heading the Evelina's 100th Centennial Celebration that is going to be taking place in September. Um, there's so many places involved and so many different dates that I think it's best uh, if you're interested in learning about the calendar and the itinerary that uh, you go online and visit hostos.cuny.edu slash culture arts. All right, we have to take a quick break okay. for one return. We're going to hear about this year's dance parade celebrating diversity and dance. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome back. So the Dance Parade New York is back on the streets of NYC. <laughs> Woo! All right, so the world's only parade to exclusively celebrate and showcase the diversity of dance uh, and celebrate the eclectic dance styles from around the world, featuring over 10,000 dancers and presenting more than 100 unique styles of dance is back. And now in their 16th year, their, uh, their mission, of course, is to continue to promote dance as an expressive and unifying art form, educating the general public about the opportunities to experience dance while celebrating diversity of dance in New York City. And here to share more details about this year's parade activities is Dance Parade NYC Executive Director, Greg Miller. Hey. <laughs> Hi, Rena. How you doing? Oh, you know, hopefully this will be the last time that I'm interviewing you in a box. I'm hoping. I'm hoping, <laughs> hoping, hoping. I'm I'm very excited for you guys because you're heading back into the street. We will be heading back in studio very soon. Uh, but in the meantime, I, I'm really looking forward to hearing all this exciting preparations that have been going into effect, preparing to be on the street of New York. <sighs> yeah, it was... Uh... Kind of crazy a couple of years ago, we, we were all set to do our virtual parade and I mean our live parade and um, the pandemic happened. So we had to switch over and learn how to do these these shows in boxes. Um, yeah, and I gotta say though, you did a you y'all did a really great job of of being innovative and improvising. I mean, it, it, you, you did some pretty crafty stuff. So I, I do want to acknowledge you for that. But it's, there's nothing like being in person. Nothing. We, we had some help. We we kind of copied the Easter Bonnet Parade. We sent over our production team to help out. You know, seeing how how do you use this thing called Zoom? It was brand new for us. And we, but we learned how to spotlight, you know, th thousands of people and just, you know, to highlight them and to we tried new things, you know, having dance battles, for example, we're not usually competitive, but we we would get everybody on the screen, you know, dancing. And then we had a, you know, a system where you could actually, you know, the audience could poll and, and choose their favorites. So that and so I yeah. wanted to ask, wait, before you even continue, because you went so global, right? And even though the dance parade in, in its essence is global, it's different because, be, you know, having gone virtual, you were actually communicating with the rest of the world. How's that going to work this year? So this year, we, we, we would have loved to try the hybrid model, but um, we're just focusing on actually getting back to the streets, which is our theme. Um, it's it's a lot to you know consider. Okay, it is still kind of COVID lands. We have to you know be careful about how we you know work with people. But then just to to have people dance again in the streets to get to see who's out there. Are there dance companies that just went away because of the pandemic? New York is expensive to live, and pe people have sometimes moved away, and and their dance groups they couldn't rehearse so a lot of people have moved on so we we had to really you know pull people back <laughs> including our team but there's an incredible energy right now to to really you know have that live experience and we think you know this is going to help heal from the pandemic um just being reconnected again and really celebrating the live performance you know i think we believe that 
you know, the communal human experience is uplifted and we can help create a more vibrant, equitable society when we have all these different forms dancing. Together. I know. And that's one of the things I've always admired about the parade the most is like it, 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 it is in its true essence, diverse, not only in culture, in dance styles, in individuals. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the experience is communal. Um, pr uh, perfect word, because everybody's just really celebrating together without looking at anything else. And that's that's kind of, you know, what how we we program it is to really look at you know what's missing and and you know we we didn't have an irish group so we 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 found an irish group we didn't have you know that many hip-hop groups so we got them and um ukrainians we were like we really gotta honor that we did that in 2014 during the crimea crisis and so we just last minute found this beautiful group um we we learned that the ukrainian festival in the east village is actually the same weekend as Dance Parade, the, the 21st, but they're not dancing because of the war. And they're like, our hearts are broken, so we can't really celebrate through dance. And then they recommended someone to me and they turned out to have 300 Ukrainian students all in these incredible costumes from different regions of Ukraine. And they're gonna start the parade and, and you know, bring us back to the streets so it's so exciting you know to and to so practice. monumental and so deliberate too right because in dancing really like, they're sending out that good vibrational energy um you know, although you know it's an unfortunate circumstances in which they're they're going to be dancing under that we hope ends sooner than later um <clears throat> but that's beautiful that's beautiful that uh, you're able to uh open up with them and and honor um, what we're all dealing with, um, because even though they're over there, we're, we're still affected by it. So um, I also wanted to make note of our this year's marshals and how how were they chosen. I know you have Eduardo Bilaro, who um, is a dear friend of mine from Ballet Hispanico. Um, and I know you also have Heidi um, Latsky, and you also have Rich Medina, DJ Rich Medina, who I also know. Um, so how, how do you choose your grand marshals? It, it is a process. We, we really focus on what, what is a diverse way to present dance and culture. And um, we had a contact at Ballet Hispanico. And, um, you know, during the pandemic, there was something called the band concert, B-A-A-N-D. And it was band together for the arts. And, and the first live performance in the city happened at Lincoln Center. And it was presented there with uh, Ba uh, Ballet Hispanico, uh, Dance Theater of Harlem, Alvin Ailey, New York City Ballet, and um, and one more that's not coming to mind. <laughs> but it, they they basically represent uh, the the dance in in New York City, and they have never had the chance to come together. It was only because of the pandemic they're all in the same you know city at the same time. And so it was at that concert that someone said, you know, oh, Ballet Hispanico would, would have a great um, Grand Marshal. Um, we just had Virginia Johnson from Dance Theater of Harlem uh, in the virtual event. Um, we actually had her in, in a film called The Resilience of Dance Through the Pandemic. And we went around seeing what was going on during the pandemic. How are these dance companies surviving um, not many could do a concert like the, the big ones at Lincoln Center. Um, and they were, they were doing it. They were coming out and dancing on their rooftops. Um, one, I, I think I saw that film. Was Michaela Malazzi involved in that? From was, Michaela, yeah. Yeah. She, she, um, we asked her, you know, can you help us do a live parade, uh, you know, for, for TV um, to make it look like a parade, kind of like the... Macy's Day Parade, and we tried. We asked everybody we knew in TV, you know, let's see if we can do this and just get all the dancers there and make it look like a parade. Um, that didn't work. <laughs> um, the pandemic was scary. People were- I know, oh, I know. Yeah. And we're still so, kind of sort of dealing with it, but 
it, it's really a matter of like navigating it, hopefully towards the end of it um at least that's what i'm putting out there because yeah. I, I think it's so important for us to come back together but i i also understand that we have to be precautious yeah so that was actually the theme last year <laughs> dance brings us together and we 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 had this idea for the tv thing and it turned out to be a film that we entered in the Emmys Awards. So we're going to find out in June. Before we go, I, I just want to share with our viewers what May 21st looks like. Uh, the start point, the time. I know there's an after party. Is that still happening? It sure is. Um, we start the day off at noon. So we're rolling back um, an hour to our usual um, start time. And that's at 20th and Broadway. Mayor Eric Adams will be there. Uh, the first time we've had the mayor at the parade and nice. he'll be helping to cut the ribbon at noon. It'll go down uh, Broadway through Union Square and across 8th Street St. Mark's uh, through our grandstand. We're having two actual sets of bleacher grandstands and uh, that's in Astor Place. Um, and then it ends at Tompkins Square Park in the East Village where the dance fest begins. And that is um, uh, kind of the best of, and you, ha you have all these opportunities to learn styles of dance, to do a dance party. Uh, we're gonna wheel in the pirate ship that we have in the parade, and that'll be like the DJ console for DJ Rich Medina. Um, there's eight different styles of dance offered that everybody can learn. And there's a break dancing competition uh, oh, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's being brought on by USA Breaking. And did you know, Rena, that the uh, breakdancing is going to be in the Olympics in 20? Yeah, I heard. I heard. <laughs> so we get to actually have the qualifier, the person who goes to the Olympics from New York, uh, will be the winner of this dance uh, competition. So oh, wow. that is the schedule of the festival. Then we'll go on to the after party at New Blue. Um, which is just a couple blocks away. Thank you, Greg Miller, Executive Director of Dance Parade NYC. And you guys, once again, the Dance Parade NYC is taking place Saturday, May 21st, beginning at noon, starting at 20th Street and Broadway. If you're interested in more information, you can visit danceparade.org. All right, stay tuned because Bobby C's Weekly Sports Roundup is coming up next. <laughs> The newest member of the San Francisco 49ers by way of the Bronx joins us this morning, Nick Zakel from Fordham. Nick, how's it going, man? How are you? Congratulations. Doing well. Thanks for having me. So excited to be able to speak with you this morning. I know you're getting a chance to head on out to San Francisco this week. Tell us a little bit about draft night. I mean, that's got to be the most exciting time for a college player to be hearing their name announced during the NFL draft. Yeah, so it was definitely a very exciting, but also just kind of really uh, nerve wracking, really long day overall draft. Uh, day three started at around noon, kind of didn't really get picked uh, until about four. So I think it was kind of uh, very nerve wracking for my entire family, just kind of waiting for that call. And uh, when um, when uh, John Lynch and Coach Shanahan called finally, uh, there was just there was so much excitement in the room, kind of uh, really just didn't know how to react yet. And it was kind of just uh, it was a great it was a great experience, great feeling. The, the fact that I was able to experience it with my family around me was just just kind of meant the world to me just because they're the ones that have sacrificed so much for me to be where I am and kind of really pushed me to be the best person, best player, best student uh, all around, just kind of uh, really just kind of uh, made sure that I excelled in anything I did. So I definitely think that I wouldn't be in the position I am without them and just kind of being able to enjoy the success uh, well, with them is something that I kind of uh, really grateful for. I think it's so crazy, too, because over the years, it's always been said that, you know, you can't have players from New York. But now you're starting to see more and more players, if not just from the city, coming from programs like Fordham. And at one point, you know, Fordham was a place that turned out a lot of NFL players. And now I think that's starting to become the trend. I mean, we recently had Chase Edmonds on the show. And there's a couple of teammates, too, that were on your team this past season that might be in the draft as well. Tell us a little bit about what it's like being that guy from New York uh, getting a chance to uh, play in the NFL. 
so yeah, I mean, obviously, kind of uh, not there, not very much name recognition as opposed to these other uh, like Power Five schools and that. But I think that's kind of really just shows the you kind of have a chip on your shoulder, really. That uh, I think that um, being from Fordham, you kind of got a little uh, being from the Bronx, um, uh, going to school there, you kind of have a little uh, grit about you. So I think that's something that really pushes myself to work harder and harder, just because that uh, to make sure that I had the opportunities to forge myself. I think that um, having guys who uh, have been in front of me do it like, like Chase, I think just kind of being able to really follow in his footsteps and kind of really uh, see the hard work that he put in and the success he's having and just kind of thinking to myself, okay, if I just work as hard as him, kind of even harder in some areas and just kind of push myself as much as I can, then I really be able to kind of enjoy that success as well. Yeah, Nick, I mean, I, I, re I remember for me about maybe, you know, 10, 20 years ago before Fordham kind of reemerged. I mean, we've gotten a chance over the years to chronicle players like John Skelton. I think at one point in this kind of tri-state area, a, a program that was turning out some NFL players was Hofstra. You know, we had Willie Colon on the show. I mean, people might remember the great Wayne Corbett, you know, and then that program doesn't have football anymore, which tended to be a trend for some of these tri-state area schools. I own a college in Hofstra, got rid of their football programs. At one point, Fordham didn't have a football program. They brought it back. And now to me right now, if you're talking about this uh, metro area, if it's not Syracuse or one of the other schools north of us, uh, Fordham football is the place to be. Definitely, I agree. I think that just shows that the, the testament to how the coaches are doing because there's definitely a lot of talent in the tri state area alone and kind of uh, also being able to kind of recruit other areas as well, uh, especially me being from Cleveland. I think that being able to uh, dip into different talent pools, but I think that uh, just from the tri state area, you know, those uh, couple states, I think around uh, Fordham really have a sufficient talent to be successful. Uh, at the D1 level, um, especially FCS ball. So I think that's something that uh, really a lot of guys don't realize because I think the guys really want to go for the big name schools. But I think that just being able to get the opportunity to play uh, and get your education, especially at a great school like Ford, which is something that uh, really stuck out to me. I think that's a, it's a great opportunity of itself. You've been a standout player both on the field and also in the classroom, even from the high school days, National Honor Society, as you mentioned, in, uh, in Ohio, in Cleveland right now, but going to high school in Ohio, team captain in high school, team captain at Fordham. And to me, I mean, what an amazing story. I mean, to be a zero star recruit, six foot five, 325 pounds, getting a chance to even play meaningful games as a freshman, both playing left tackle, right tackle. And now there's some rumors that the Niners might actually use you at center. Yeah, so I think that obviously uh, talking with the uh, staff there, I think obviously they kind of see me as more of an interior guy, which uh, especially after being uh, at, uh, at the senior bowl playing more guard than I uh, tackle that I did at Fordham, I've become much more comfortable position, to the position. I think there's a lot more nuances uh, uh, being inside rather than outside. I think that's something that I'm really starting to pick up more and more learning about the game as I go. I think center is just something that uh, you have knowledge of the offense, being able to kind of make calls, lead guys where they're going. I think that's something that I'm uh, really, as a challenge, I think that I'm really open to accepting. And I think that's something that I'm really excited to get the opportunity for. Nick, I was actually interested in asking you about that senior bowl because I was curious if it helped your draft stock or if you felt it helped your draft stock. Uh, I definitely think it did. Uh, I think Mr. Uh, Jim Nagy down there does a great job of putting on the game. I think that uh, kind of just the ability to really showcase yourself for all 32 NFL teams. I think I was, I was able to, you're able to speak with every single team there, uh, kind of quick little interview. Um, so that's something that I think is a very, uh, very advantageous as, as opposed to the other uh, all-star games. I think that I'm really, I'm really grateful that I was able to kind of show uh, my ability there, kind of meet with teams, kind of uh, talk around. And I think definitely think that, uh, it definitely uh, helped my draft stock in the end. Now you get selected in the sixth round, 187 overall, but I mean, there were some rumors you could go to some other teams. I had noticed even in New England as high as the fourth round, uh, sixth round, still nothing to shake a stick at. I mean, are you happy about where you were selected? And then of course, what the process was like and getting an opportunity to even go to the Niners. Oh, of course. I think that uh, first off, it's a great opportunity to be go to such a storied um, team as the, the Niners with the great players they have currently and have they had in the past. I think that's something that uh, you can tell it's a really great culture in that locker room. I really can't wait to become a part of it. And then I think just uh, for being where I was picked, I'm extremely grateful. Obviously, uh, guys want to go earlier, but I mean, just be able to get my foot in the door, just be able to get my name called is something that I'm really grateful for that I really wouldn't trade anything for the world. So I'm really happy about that. Thank you guys started the season. I mean, what a big game, getting a chance to play at Nebraska. A lot of buzz for Fordham football on campus at Rose Hill. And then that game ends up being, you know, at least in the early going, a very good game. And I bring that one up because there was a lot of talk, of course, after it, the headlines. We even mentioned it here on the show about the performance that Ryan Greenhagen had. 
But during that stretch there, when getting a chance to talk to some of the scouts that were looking at that game, the player that they wanted to see was was you. It wasn't Ryan Greenhagen. Yeah, so I mean, the, of course, that uh, the performance by Green Eagle that game was just something uh, video game numbers you see. I think that just shows the testament to his hard work and how much he's going after it. And I'm excited to see, really see what he's able to do this uh, this coming up uh, this coming year. Um, and this, yeah, I think that uh, the opportunity to play against a Big Ten team like Nebraska, a very good, a very good, solid defense, especially in that Big Ten, uh, was an opportunity I think really uh, helped me a lot. Just because of kind of a, uh, especially being from FCS school, you kind of always a question mark that people always have is, okay, can he play against solid talent? I think that being able to play against Nebraska, having the performance I did, I think that's something that really helped me a lot. Uh, in the end. So I think that kind of without that game, I wouldn't be standing here today. I think that I had to thank Coach Collin for uh, kind of scheduling that and really pushing our boundaries. And again, I think it was just a, a tremendous football experience from uh, not playing the 2020 season to playing in front of 85, 90,000 in Lincoln, Nebraska. It was just such a surreal experience. I'm uh, glad I was able to experience it with my teammates. How difficult was this stretch? You know, I, I know you got a chance to be here in the Bronx for five seasons and one of them, of course, abbreviated and COVID just such a tough thing for everyone in the borough, but also pretty much around the world when it comes to just living. But then, of course, trying to get back to normalcy and play sports. You know, what was that experience like for you guys at Fordham? Yeah, it was definitely tough at first, I think, just because the uh, it had the sense of accountability to make sure that uh, we were all staying safe with all the uh, measures in place. So I think that was something that really um kind of had uh, really affected some guys a lot. I think just kind of uh, with how you want to play football, you really want just want to focus on the game. But I think that with all the those different events happening around, I think it was a lot of tough, it was very tough on guys, but I think that just showed the testament to how strong our culture was as a team, just being able to keep together, kind of keep the guys uh, motivated going forward, whether it was, okay, we don't have a game this following week. We don't really know when the next game is, but I think this week got to just keep our heads down and work as hard as possible. I think in the end, it will really show payoff. I think we did kind of have a successful season. We'll continue our conversation with NFL rookie Nick Sakel on Monday. Hey everyone, and welcome back to Open. So May is Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And as we recognize the contributions and influence of Asian and Pacific Island Americans, uh, our last guest is a Queens native playwright, performer, acoustic punk rock Rockateur and educator. I just love that word. And his plays and performances have been seen off Broadway, throughout the US, in Paris, Hong Kong, Guangzhou, China. And his lyrics, uh, his plays, lyrics, and memoirs highlight the New York City Asian American experience on stage. Uh, in his new memoir, Our Laundry, Our Town, My Chinese American Life from Flushing to the Downtown Stage and Beyond, details his upbringing in Flushing, Queens in the 70s, being first generation to Chinese immigrant parents, helping his helping run his family's laundry, living in two worlds of traditional Chinese culture and the underworld of what? Punk rock, of course. <laughs> Here now to share more is playwright, performer, and acoustic punk rock raconteur and educator, Alvin Eng. Hello and welcome. Uh, hello, Rena. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. Oh, thank you for being here with us. And, and I'm giggling because, you know, I, I just love the term acoustic punk rock rockateur. Yes, yes. <laughs> They're always trying to put together disparate elements that really, really have no, seemingly on the surface, have no business being together, but they really do belong. Yeah, I get it. I get it. I get it. <laughs> and not only that, as an educator, it's kind of like, well, you know, go look it up and then figure it out, you know? <laughs> <laughs> But thank you for being here with us, and uh, congratulations on your on your new book. Um, and, uh, and and let's just open up with um, this new memoir that you're talking about, uh, just being of the '70s and, and living two worlds. I mean, I want to say that I, I, as New Yorkers, isn't that the same story for all of us, even if we are from a different culture? No, absolutely. Like uh, we, so so many of us, like uh, of course, because New York is the most diverse place in the world. We all we all live like different lives in some ways. And uh, so growing growing up when I did too, um, it it really was a it was a different. Like in the seventies, the world the, the city was crazy. It was it was it was it was a wild place. And yet I would go home. But you know, my, my parents had an arranged marriage, so it's like going home to a household that was like a rooted in a, not just a different culture, but almost like a different century. So it, it was um, it's very bizarre that way, but uh, it, it also put things in a 
in place too. I started to get feel my like my punk rock goes. I, I I painted my fingernails black and everything. But uh, and the first time I came. <laughs> home, <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just visualizing, right? And and, and just by what you just said. Uh, with regards to your parents uh, being in an arranged marriage and 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 remaining married and and raising you and now you're um, I guess what they would consider rebelling right painting your nails black. Yes, yes, but they put it. They kept it in perspective though. Uh, my mother also had a wicked sense of humor. Uh, she looked at my nails the first time and just said, "Ha ha ha, Batman." <laughs> she put me right in my place. So. Uh, <laughs> And so, so it was very grounding to have that too. And um, no, and it, it was uh, like so many of the immigrant families, Chinese, they, 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 I guess that cliche was true. We also, also had either a Chinese hand laundry or a restaurant and our family had the laundry you know, out in Flushing. Right, right, right. So um, so just share with us um, what you learned from being of service in, in that capacity. No, it really was very, very different. You, you saw the world from a very different perspective and um, you know, the, the, the laundry at that, at that at that time, it was still the end of, uh, I guess, the Cold War effects in some ways, um, like uh, where China was a uh, public enemy number two, and um, I guess public enemy number one still is Russia right now. But uh, so that was then and, and now. So, how some things don't change. I always say in life, uh, a lot of times the questions remain the same, but hopefully the, the answers are always different. We, we, we always hope for that. So so just it was uh, so growing up in that way, too, it was it was a very it was a very different world. Not, we didn't have as much acceptance because only only one of my parents spoke English too. So only and um and so it so it, it really was a, a very different time. And and from our, our perspective, you get like a, when I was when I was a kid, I thought, how come my, my parents just stay within their own circles? Like, why don't they socialize with other people? And then you you, you get old and you realize there was a precedent for that. You know, my you know they had to escape uh, the law, the Chinese Exclusion Act. That was the first, and God help us, may that be the last American law that made it legal for one race of people to become citizens here. And that just stuck. Even though my parents came right after that, they still had to circumnavigate it with uh, with false identification papers. But they that uh, that that set that set the mold, if you will, for a lot of Chinese American and even Asian American socialization. They stayed. They really stayed off the started to stay under the radar. You know, and, and then there's that that you were living in Flushing, right, Where, which is predominantly, it's a predominantly Asian neighborhood, and it still is to this day. Right now, but uh, I'm, I'm a little bit older, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm 25, and I'm a little bit older, so, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, my, my coming of age in the, in the late, in the late 20th century, in the 70s and 80s, it's been a lot about uh, American uh, assimilation and immigration, like, um, right, right. Up, we, were, we were one of the few, it, Believe it or not, we were one of the few Asian families in Flushing at that time. And I, I tried like everyone really worked very hard to assimilate. And by the time I got there, there was no there there. Because when I when I when I got old enough, all of a sudden it was bizarre. All of a sudden Flushing was filled with the uh, Asian immigrants. So I was the only ABC, you know, American born Chinese who and I regret it now, but I rebelled. I refused to learn to speak Chinese, didn't learn to so um so all of a sudden everyone looked like for the first time in my life. Everyone looked like me, but I couldn't communicate with any of them because I, I I didn't speak any Chinese. Do you speak Chinese now? Well, very little, very very little. I you know I regret that, but I I I rebelled then, and um, and it was it was a different world then. Like you know, you wanted to just fit in what, what was around you. And in the seventies, you know, it was it was uh, we just wanted to be one way, and uh, and so so that really said a lot about about how how things were changing changing with us too. And and, and it's amazing that Flushing became the second Chinatown while I was there. So it, it said a lot about how our, our world and culture changed. And so, does your book take us on that trip? Yes, it does. Very much starts off like in in, in laundry, where you know we had a, a, there was a lot like people would would open the door and yell at my parents like you know Chinky Cho go home and everything. So we we had to deal with all that. So so we would look at that how 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 that changed. But then um. We would always go to Chinatown, but then always, always the. That's why the. I guess all all outsiders gravitate towards the arts, and uh, in, in my time, it really the first time I felt I could fit in somewhere was with uh, was, with, was with punk rock worlds, like you know, like being out of boroughs kids, like um. And I love that we'll always call Manhattan the city, no matter how old we get. People who grew up in the outer boroughs always call Manhattan the city. city. So, uh, <laughs> So they were they were like people, of course, in my neighborhood that would never leave Flushing, maybe never have, but uh, I knew why there was a seven train in our town, and I was on that train all the time. And uh, so, 
So it was, it was like it was like growing up in a small town in New York City in the 70s at the same time. And the book talks a lot about that. You know, that's one of the beauties of, of living in New York. And, and it continues to be the beauty of living in New York is that, you know, you can get on the train and you can travel anywhere. And then all of a sudden you feel like you're in a different part of the world. So thank you for sharing um, what a little excerpt of what it means to travel on the seven train back in the 70s. <laughs> I know we, we're out of time. I wish we could talk more. More, but uh, you're going to give us a little taste of the book anyway. So I just want you guys to know, uh, don't go anywhere because when we return, Alvin Ang, he's going to perform for us after the break. So you don't want to miss. <laughs> hey, everyone. Welcome back here now to read from Our Laundry, Our Town. Let's give it up for Alvin Ang. Lose that. This ain't the mainland. I'm the Gung Hey Kid. Hope you understand. Don't do no kowtowing on the Rick Jaws. So don't be talking about dragons or the Great Wall. Ain't good in math. Don't know Kung Fu. Diddle for Confucius or Fu Manchu. So don't mess with me or call me Bruce Lee. Cause ain't no one better than Kid Gung Hey. Right me Gung Hey. Right me Gung Hey. Well, that is from Right Me Gung Hey. That's like the title song of my punk rap musical, The Gung Hey Kid. And in 1994, The Gung Hei Kid became the first Asian American play to be produced at the historic New Eurekan Poets Cafe. Rock Me Gung Hei is the show's finale. It's an homage to public enemies, fight the power and uh, do the right thing. The 1989 Spike Lee joint in which the song ignites the opening credits along with some spectacular raw wild style dancing from the one and only Rosie Perez. People's Lives Like Dreams, the play's prologue and epilogue it's a traditional Cantonese lullaby that my mother used to sing around our laundry and our house. These two lyrics represented the contours of my disposition during the late 1980s, early 1990s multiculturalism movement. In New York City, this era was famously celebrated as the gorgeous mosaic by our first black mayor, the late Honorable David Dinkins. In the end, the gorgeous mosaic was the most healing, empowering, and exhilarating period. It made most of us accept and process a more nuanced and complex portrait of who we were as a city, as a society, and as a world. Yet inevitably, every answer of affirmation that the gorgeous mosaic offered posed even more complicated questions. The underside of the gorgeous mosaic era was the fight and resiliency required to celebrate and represent our unique identities, communities, and cultures. Scenes and worlds often change on a whim. Oftentimes it takes an epidemic and everything in between. Each and every performance and work of art is a statement and celebration of being. All representation is personal and political. We must seize the moment and realize it while we can. I say it <laughs> all the time. Thank you very much, Alvin Ang. That is all about being present. And of course, embracing the mosaic that is New York. That was uh, Alvin Ang reading from Our Laundry, Our Town, My Chinese American Life. From Flushing to Downtown Stage, it's set to release May 17th on Fordham University Press and on Amazon. Alvin will have a virtual book launch reading on May 20th as part of the Friday lecture series at the Asian American Asian Research Institute at City University of New York at 5.30, between 5.30 and seven. And then the in-person book launch is the same day um, from seven to nine at City Lore Gallery, which is located at 56 East First Street in the East Village. For more information, visit Alvin Ang. Dot com. <clears throat> that is our show today, mi gente. Thanks to all our guests for coming through and to you, our viewers, for tuning in. If you missed any part of the show, you can check out the Recablecast tonight and 24 hours a day at bronxnet.tv. I'm Rina Valentin, and from all of us here at Open, may the universe provide paz, prosperity, y amor, and to all our friends, happy Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Adios.